Uh, next, we have um, Caddy Kay uh, of the BBC uh, interviewing Senator Amy Klobuchar, who just killed in, her, in this election. She won in Minnesota by 35 points. Uh, people are saying she uh, owns the state like Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> and is better looking. Oh, wow. Well, well. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Senator Klobuchar, thank you very much for joining us here um, at the Ideas Forum. Congratulations on your victory. Thank you. Convincing. Yes. Not a tight race up there in Minnesota. No. It was, uh, uh, it was, it was actually a lot of fun in our state. We uh, had um, some amendments that were divisive, and no one ever thought we could beat them. We did. And so the voter turnout in Minnesota was 76% of eligible wow. voters, so it was really uh, quite a story. That's fantastic. Um, and now, of course, you uh, will join a new Senate um, makeup in January in which there will be 20% participation by women. That's right, 20 women for the first time in history. I was telling Caddy out in the, uh, in the green room that this morning we, for the first time, had a traffic jam in the women senators' bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> women in there. There's only two stalls, and I'm not going to say who. That would be really bad for decorum, but there were five of us in there, two newly elected. Uh, so it's very exciting. So and you know just, things uh, are good for women in politics when uh, there's a queue is. in the restroom. And the women senators group is very collegial. Uh, we have 17 of us now. Uh, we have dinner every other month in the Strom Thurmond room, which is somewhat funny for anyone that remembers the story, with the statue of Strom I Thurmond looking think. down on us. Uh, and uh, we had, whatever is said in that room stays in that room. Uh, we never talk about the male senators. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but it's been uh, very, in terms of all seriousness, the group has worked well together. Sometimes all of us on legislation, uh, especially when it's with respect to women's health and Burma and some other things. And then, um, but mostly we forge these relationships. So my first bill was with Olympia Snow. Uh, Kay Bailey and I did a bunch of things together on the Commerce Committee. Uh, and uh, there are a number of women that are problem solvers. And I think you saw that coming through in this election with the election of people like Heidi Heikamp uh, in a race that no one thought she could win. Uh, but they saw her as someone that would compromise and get things done. Uh, there was someone that studied women elected officials a while back in Boston uh, who had this uh, uh, quote that isn't exactly accurate, but she said that women politicians speak softly and carry a big statistic. Um, and I don't really think they speak softly anymore, uh, but there is a model of women who have had to come through the ranks uh, against all odds where they focus more on accountability. When I was running for county attorney, I would look at uh, the records of Janet Napolitano as governor of Arizona and Kathleen Sebelius in Kansas because on their websites they showed what their goals were and what they got done. And I think you see that in some of the women and actually some of the male senators as well that made it through this election because while the balance of power stayed the same in Washington, there was definitely a rejection of people who had rigid ideologies. People wanted to see things get done and compromise. They didn't want to see people uh, swinging at each other from the opposite corners of the boxing ring. There are sometimes generalizations made about how women do manage things, and we see it in business as we do in politics, that women tend to be more consensual, that we are good at cooperating, we tend to be more risk averse than men do. Um, is that your experience in politics, and do you think it, it matters to the population in general? We seem to have a few men in the audience here, but does it matter to them that there are more women in politics as well? Well, when I talk to men, they, many of them have daughters, and they think it's great to see more women in power, that it's role models uh, for their own daughters. Um, and I do believe there's just a different spirit. And you look at, actually, the last year in the Senate, and I would argue, uh, despite the public image of Congress right now, the Senate actually was moving things after the debt ceiling debacle. Uh, we got through the patent reform bill, the farm bill. You, you go through, there's about six bills that got done in the Senate marching through votes on multiple amendments. But what's interesting about it, given the percentage of women, 17 right now, um, some of the most successful efforts were led by the women. Barbara Boxer, against all odds, worked out a deal with Jim Inhofe. Okay, they're not exactly the same, ideologically. <laughs> um, and got the transportation bill done. Uh, Susan Collins got the postal reform bill done that's still uh, sitting over in the House. And Debbie Stabenow led a heroic effort um, on, the, um, on the farm bill. So you do actually see the results. It's not just talk and rhetoric of the women as problem solvers. You've seen them get things done. 
Uh, and it's just, a, I think there's just a different attitude and also we help each other across the aisle. Yeah, I think I've seen a study that women in, uh, on Capitol Hill propose more bills and manage to keep more bills alive than their mm -hmm. male counterparts do. And I think you're right that there was something about this election that wanted action um, from Congress. Do you think the public is going to be rewarded uh, by a Congress that is actually going to be able to get more done? You mentioned the Senate, but of course a lot of those bills have ended up stuck in the House. Will this uh, Congress be able to get more done than the last one did? I really don't think there's a choice. Um, anyone that's looked at uh, this election and has talked to people out in their states know that's what people want. Our country just can't stand still anymore. Uh, we have an obligation to bring the debt down. I think it should be in a balanced way, and I think the electorate spoke loudly on that point. But um, we need to do that. We need to do some positive things for the economy. And I look at everything from making sure that our workers are getting the degrees they need, including in science, technology, engineering, math. We should be doing much more at the high school level with one and two year degrees. The opportunity of immigration reform uh, that came out loud and clear through this election, uh, where you have now 10% of the electorate uh, Hispanic, 75% uh, of them voting for the president, and you're already hearing uh, many of the Republicans starting to talk about the possibility of moving on immigration reform. So there are some real opportunities that will move, I believe, move our economy along. Uh, if we can compromise and get together on this debt, do something consistent on tax reform, and then work on these problems like energy, comprehensive energy policy that really aren't problems, they're opportunities in the making. Uh, so I am actually much more optimistic than some. As you mentioned, Hubert Humphrey, I have his desk, so that helps uh, in the Senate. Actually, they originally gave me Gordon Humphrey's desk by mistake, a little-known senator from New Hampshire, um, but eventually they corrected they it. They got the right one. Yeah, right. Um, the president has just given a press conference. I don't know if you had the chance to hear it, but he was sounding feisty on the issue of taxes. I mean, he, he, he seemed to be saying that he was given a mandate in this election by the American people um, not to continue with tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. He said that if there was one difference between Mitt Romney and his campaign, it was that he opposes the idea of the wealthiest continuing to have those tax cuts. I mean, if that is the position of the president and it continues to be the position of the Democrats, is it going to hold things up in terms of budget negotiations with real Republican colleagues? You know, I look at this in one very simple way, and that's that I want to bring the debt down. Uh, and when you look at the Bush tax cuts, uh, and it's, the way I explain it to people in my state is people making over $250,000 a year, their first $250,000 would be taxed at the Bush levels, even if they make a million. After that, it goes to the Clinton levels. Why is that important? It saves about $700 billion over 10 years on the debt. That's why we're so interested in that particular proposal. Uh, and I actually ran on it six years ago. I ran ads on it. Um, uh, because I see it as a way to bring in the money. It's not about taxing the wealthy. It's about what are some smart ways we can do this. And one of them is that. The other is spending cuts. And it has to be a, a, a really a shared sacrifice here. Uh, and I think people are ready for it, and that's what the president's referring to. If it was brought in some small amount of money, I think then you could say, oh, it's symbolic. It was just about the election. It actually brings in a big chunk of change that could help us to bring the debt down when you add that to the spending cuts and some of the other subsidies and other things that, that can be cut. i give you one example. Uh, ethanol, I'm a big biofuel state. I believe in biofuels. They're 10% of our fuel supply right now. Um, and those, those breaks have basically gone away. That was $60 billion in 10 years. Oil is $40 billion in 10 years. It's still there. And we are really proud of the oil drilling that's going on in the Midwest and the natural gas extraction and everything happening. But the question is, do we still need that subsidy? You add that, the oil and the ethanol together, that's $100 billion in 10 years. That is 10% of the trillion I'd like to see from the subsidies and some of the loopholes. So there's a reason and a very rational reason uh, we should be talking about these things. It's not just about politics. It really isn't. It's about how do we rationally bring down this debt over 10 years without start creating some kind of sharp contraction for the economy and be able to do it with the political support you need to get it done. But what are, is the money uh, that's there so we can really bring the debt down and then encourage that investment from the world, make people realize that our economy is solvent and move forward in a rational way. I love the idea that Washington isn't about politics. <laughs> That's well, a possibility. I'm just, you know, if you just look <laughs> at the rational. actual, what did, Bill, what did Bill Clinton say? <laughs> 
arithmetic. You know, I like that moment for two reasons. I liked it because he was obviously on a partisan basis that he was pointing out what numbers added up, what didn't. But I also like that our base, the Democrats, were all chanting for arithmetic. Uh, because I think both sides are going to have to realize that this has to add up and it just can't be sound bites on TV. And the other, the last thing I'd say that gives me hope, I marched through all those bills. Those were real bills that got passed, mid-sized, complicated bills. It was always 62 to 75 votes in the U.S. Senate. We be beat the filibuster and got it done. So that should give you hope that a debt deal is possible in the Senate. And all some of those bills, the majority of them, after we got it done, there was pressure on the House to get it done. And it is a group that of us that have been supportive of the Debt Commission report, of uh, that general framework, we may not agree with everything in it, that has continued to push and meet uh, and it's somewhere between, depending on the day, 40 to 55 senators or so that's been meeting um, off and on for the last year uh, to try to push those things through. So right. there's a devotion to getting it done in the Senate. But you still have senior Republicans, including Paul Ryan, who are saying it is not in their intention to raise tax rates. They want to do this with loopholes. What they say is they don't want to agree um, to a whole load of tax hikes now for spending cuts that they don't think are ever going to actually materialize. How are you going to work with the Republicans in the House if they are going to carry on saying, listen, this is not something we're going to negotiate? On, as they have done for the last two years. I mean, you, you've still got that makeup that you're going to have to deal with, right? Uh, you do, but there has been some change there, and Speaker Boehner has you know, put out the olive branch and signified that he's willing to talk, uh, and that's what negotiations are about. But I just look at these, the Clinton-Bush tax cut issue and where you put the rates as a major part of the solution when you look at the amount of money you can bring in uh, and you add that into some of the deductions, other things we're talking about, fine. Uh, but that is a big chunk of change. And in the uh, press conference that he just gave, the president seemed to leave some flexibility yes, between that. those. One of my um, colleagues, we had a Senate meeting, so I missed it, but they did pass their BlackBerry around. over to me to show me that sentence. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, clearly he's showing flexibility, which I think is important, but uh, clearly the Republicans in the House have to, too. So this is going to be a Congress in which you think we are going to, by the end of this year, have sorted out the fiscal cliff? Are you confident of that? I think that we will have have to have sorted out part of it and sorted out a plan to move forward. I don't think every T will be crossed and every I will be dotted, but there's some things we should be doing at the end of the year. There's the doctor's reimbursement issue. Uh, there's going to be the estate tax issue to try to keep those exemptions in place uh, where they are now. Uh, there are um, a number of things that should get done at the end of the year and then some that could be extended as long as it's very clear that there's an end date here, two, three months, whatever we want to do. The comprehensive tax reform uh, which is the toughest thing, and it's going to be a business fight. And the hope is, if you look at Simpson Bowles, the suggestion there is actually bring the business tax rate down and pay for it by plugging these loopholes and getting rid of some of the subsidies. Uh, a lot of my businesses in my state were second per capita for Fortune 500 companies. We brought the world everything from the pacemaker to the post-it note. Um, they want to see that business tax rate down, and they're willing to talk about closing loopholes getting rid of some of these subsidies to do that. But that's going to be uh, obviously a major debate that could never be concluded by the end of the year, the entire comprehensive tax reform. But that has got to be the next thing that we tackle. Um, you mentioned the, the consequences of this. And of course, this election has been watched avidly around the world. American elections always are. But this time around, there's also a lot of concern around the world and in financial markets about whether America basically has become ungovernable. Because the view is that America needs to do big things to stay competitive, and the politicians aren't up to it. Mm -hmm. Are you going to defy the financial market's suspicions about this country? I think so. What is it that your uh, uh, a great leader, Winston Churchill, Wishes. said? We yep. try everything, yeah, and then, then we then finally you get, it right. get it right. Okay, well, there you go. And I think you've seen that in a number of instances in the last uh, decade with our country. It has been frustrating. Um, but we have been able, whether it was the TARP bill, the much maligned TARP bill, when we were on the real edge of the fiscal cliff uh, back when the economy uh, started sinking and we had all those problems a few years back, uh, we were able to get our act together. And what I want more than just getting our act together on the fiscal issues is just to seize this opportunity that we have now with the economy. We're actually making stuff in America again. We are exporting to the world. We're inventing things. That is the way we truly um, crawl out of this. And I see it in our state. We're down to, I think it's 5.8% unemployment now. 
and a lot of that has to do with high-tech manufacturing. Uh, it has to do with exports. We're a high export state and having an educated workforce. And I think it's a model when you look at the rest of the country, which you're starting to see in a number of Midwestern states uh, with the improvements, uh, it's a model. I head up with uh, Roy Blunt, uh, the Subcommittee on Competitiveness, Innovation, and Export Promotion. Uh, so that's our focus. And part of that focus is tourism, another area. We've lost 16% of the international market uh, since 9-11 uh, because we didn't get our act together on how we do visas. I bring that up because just adding a point back is 160,000 jobs in America. Your country had its act together in terms of getting those visas processed faster. So for a while, if you were in Shanghai, and wanted to it go was to London, easier. it took 10 days. Mm -hmm. It was taking 90 days to go to America. We have now, uh, with the help of the State Department, greatly improved that. Uh, but that is one example, and that's the tip of the iceberg, of course, on immigration reform when you look at H-1B visas. And I just see some hope there. In the tourism area, we already have Senator. Um, uh, we're doing a bill called the JOLT Act uh, with uh, myself and Senator Schumer, uh, Senator Mikulski, Senator Rubio, Senator Kirk, Senator Blunt. Uh, so we have people that are willing to step out on the visa issue on tourism, uh, and I think that that should soon extend into immigration reform, which Senator Graham and Senator Schumer are working on. On yesterday on morning, Joe, you mentioned that there was the risk, of course, of losing some Democrats in the Senate if Republicans didn't compromise as well. Um, so, you know, you're, the Democrats are going to be tough on these things as well. What is, what is there that you would like, ideally, that you are prepared to compromise on should it come to that over the budget? Well, I think that... Um, Given that both sides are going right, to have to give something. There were a number of Democrats that didn't want to see the spending cuts that we saw out of the Budget Control Act, uh, which as you know, we already did a trillion in 10 years, and then the sequestration is another 1.2 trillion by the end of this year. Um, these are automatic cuts. I would prefer that we negotiate something. Uh, that would be much better, but I keep reminding the people in my state uh, that if you're going to do this, we are going to have to make some cuts. So I think that's the number one thing on our side is to acknowledge uh, that there are going to be spending cuts. And you see people, even with the Budget Control Act, there were some Democrats that did not vote for that. Um, in my own state, you had the interesting coalition of Senator Franken and myself voted for it. Um, a couple of the Republicans in the middle voted for it and Democrats. And then you had uh, Keith Ellison, who's a more liberal Democratic congressman, uh, vote against it, and Michelle Bachman vote against it. They <laughs> voted uh, the same. Um, and I think you're going to see some of that with a debt deal, and everyone knows that. Whereas some of these bills have been more Republicans not voting with us, half, maybe half the Republicans not voting with us, here you're going to have some Democrats not voting for us with us on a debt deal. And so that's why it's even more important uh, that the uh, Republicans work with us so that we have enough numbers to get it through the Senate and obviously through the House. Well, let's hope it is going to be a Senate that can actually do something to a, a Congress that can do something. Thank yes. you very much, Senator well, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.